Hello, I'm Michelle Tapper with the latest from Science. It's been a worrying few weeks in Australia as COVID-19 cases have surged in Victoria and parts of New South Wales through community transmission. Many suburbs in Melbourne are back in lockdown and health authorities have rolled out large scale testing and tracing to try and contain the virus. Joining me today to discuss the progress is Professor Michael Kidd, Principal Medical Advisor to the Department of Health and Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Hi, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Now, obviously, the situation in Victoria and New South Wales is quite concerning for everyone. Do you think we've reached the peak yet? Well, clearly, we're very concerned about what's happening uh, at this moment uh, in Victoria and also the increase in community transmission that we've seen in New South Wales. Uh, it's too early to know uh, exactly what's going to happen over the next few days. Uh, at the time that we're speaking, um, the lockdown has been in place in Melbourne and the surrounding areas for about uh, 10 days and we're still waiting to see if we see a fall in the number of uh, new infections being reported each day. At the same time, we're seeing continuing community transmission in New South Wales. And uh, while that seems to be at a fairly steady level, again, the number of new infections is not really yet falling. So uh, we are in a dynamic situation and clearly all the measures which are in place uh, need to continue and to continue uh, to be in force uh, as, we, uh, as we watch and see what happens. I think a lot of people felt really anxious when Victoria went into lockdown again and obviously stage four restrictions are possibly even looming. Do you think this will be the new normal that will just keep having these rolling waves of lockdowns until a vaccine is developed? Well, clearly we are expecting to have continuing outbreaks occurring. The uh, first wave of the pandemic obviously is still sweeping across the world uh, and particularly uh, having an impact at this time in many lower middle income countries in South Asia, Central South America, and increasingly in Africa as well. And, uh, and we expect that there will still be people coming into Australia uh, who are infected with COVID-19, whether these are Australian Australian residents uh, returning home uh, or whether they're the crews of uh, aircraft or of uh, ships which are involved in the import and uh, export of, of products uh, into and out of the country. So whenever uh, we have contact with the outside world there's going to be continuing risks of further transmission occurring and further outbreaks occurring. Clearly what we'd like to see uh, happening right across Australia is uh, no uh, community transmission as uh, we've seen uh, at the current time in at least six of the eight jurisdictions. But uh, uh, clearly we have a very serious outbreak in Victoria and uh, a very concerning outbreak occurring in New South Wales at this time. So yes, it does look like this will be the continuing pattern uh, which we follow, which means that we are going to need to continue to be vigilant uh, about the risks of COVID-19. It means that uh, we aren't yet going to be able to return to what may have been our normal lives uh, beforehand. Obviously, we still have internal borders closed uh, within Australia, so our movement around the country is, uh, is limited uh, at this time as well. So it's, uh, again, it's, it's very dynamic, the situation uh, which we're seeing uh, in the country at this time. There's also been a lot of debate about Australia's exit strategy, whether it should be suppression or elimination. What's your view on this? Yes, you're, you're right. There's debates around suppression and elimination. The approach of the National Cabinet uh, has been rigorous suppression, which of course has resulted in effective elimination of community transmission, as I said, occurring in at least six of the eight states and territories around Australia, clearly we need to be aiming to have no community transmission occurring uh, right across Australia and I think um, uh, as, uh, as our goal. Everybody's holding out for a vaccine. 
what is the latest on vaccine development and what potential problems could we see in Australia in trying to manufacture and distribute and develop a vaccine? So clearly uh, there's a lot of focus on what's happening with the vaccine development both within Australia and also overseas. Uh, each few days we're hearing reports from different groups about uh, the successes that uh, we're seeing in the various aspects of trials which are underway and a lot of the reports that we're seeing are very promising uh, but we've got to wait obviously until we actually have the vaccine it's able to be uh, it's been shown to be safe uh, in uh, uh, in, in populations, it's able to be produced uh, and, uh, and then it has to be distributed uh, both uh, within this country and also in countries uh, all around the world. Now, uh, even when we do get a successful candidate, it may still be many months uh, after that um, successful candidate to when we actually start seeing uh, mass immunisation programs starting to occur either here or elsewhere in the world. So we are going to be living under the circumstances that we're living under at the moment uh, for some considerable time to come. Do you have any time frame on that or is it too much like gazing into a crystal ball at this stage? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it, there, there is no firm, firm timeline. We have had overnight uh, on the day that we're recording this, we had overnight uh, very positive reports from uh, uh, developers uh, both at uh, Oxford in the UK and in China uh, with promising news coming forward. But, uh, you know, we, we, we've got to remember that uh, the, the development of vaccines against uh, coronaviruses in humans has not been successful uh, to date. Uh, of course, we have uh, been living with uh, HIV for decades uh, without a vaccine uh, becoming available. So uh, while we're very heartened by what's coming forward from the uh, various research teams around the world, uh, there is still a long way to go. Absolutely. And that's difficult, I think, for a lot of people to process. And You've talked about community transmission, which is obviously what we're seeing in New South Wales and Victoria, and that's a lot different to how the pandemic started in Australia, which was basically people returning home. How difficult is it now for health authorities to trace and track people now that we have reasonably widespread community transmission in places like Melbourne and New South Wales? So unlike when COVID-19 first appeared in Australia, we are a lot better prepared now several months uh, into the pandemic. We have very extensive capacity for testing and uh, at the moment uh, we're seeing 60,000 or more tests being carried out uh, every day across Australia. Uh, we have much uh, further developed uh, capacity for contact tracing and uh, with the outbreak in Victoria we've seen contact tracing teams in other states and territories who are actually assisting uh, our colleagues in Victoria with the contact tracing uh, process. Uh, as the numbers get larger, uh, the number of people being diagnosed each day, of course the challenge of uh, carrying out uh, contact tracing uh, within a very short period of time uh, becomes more and more uh, complex but uh, again uh, further capacity is uh, is being put into the system. We've had over a thousand Australian Defence Force personnel many of whom are involved in the logistics and the uh, carrying out of the contact tracing as well. Also really worrying right now is the fact that healthcare workers on the front line in Melbourne are testing positive for COVID-19. Are they getting enough protection? So, of course, some of the healthcare worker uh, infections uh, are occurring in healthcare settings and some of them are occurring in community settings because, of course, where we have widespread community transmission, healthcare workers are living uh, in the community and are at risk, uh, as are others. We've also seen transmission uh, between people working in uh, healthcare settings. Uh, so there are a number of different uh, scenarios which, uh, which can lead to healthcare worker infection. Uh, it's absolutely imperative that we have uh, appropriate and adequate amounts of personal protective equipment available for all our healthcare workforce in the areas where we are seeing significant community transmission. And it's also absolutely imperative that our healthcare workers are 
utilising the PPE uh, appropriately uh, at all times when they're uh, encountering uh, patients who uh, could be infected with COVID-19 and also, of course, in uh, with the uh, restrictions in place uh, in uh, in in Melbourne now with the requirement for people to be wearing masks whenever they're outside of their homes that uh, that people are adhering to these requirements as well, for example, when they're travelling to and from their workplace. Now, some people are simply refusing to wear masks. Can you just provide some insight on exactly how they work and what people should look for in a mask if they want to protect themselves? Yes, so uh, clearly there's been a lot uh, in the media about masks over the last few days since the Premier of Victoria announced that mask wearing would be mandatory uh, for uh, people in the lockdown areas in Melbourne and the surrounding uh, regions uh, from uh, Thursday of this week. And, uh, and so people are going to be required uh, to wear masks. If they don't wear masks, then uh, we've been advised that people will be fined. Um, clearly, the, the optimal masks uh, are either surgical masks or uh, cloth masks with the, uh, the three layers. Uh, we have uh, heard reports that uh, people are being encouraged if they don't have immediate access uh, to uh, three-ply masks just to uh, cover their face in whatever way they can with bandanas or scarves or, uh, or other, other measures. Uh, we do know that... Um, there has been a rush on the purchase of uh, surgical masks from pharmacies and other outlets and that uh, many people are moving towards making their own. And of course, there are many uh, uh, videos on, on YouTube and elsewhere showing people about how to wear masks. The compulsory wearing of masks is not new in uh, other parts of the world uh, where community transmission has been much greater in the past than it has been uh, in Australia. So uh, there, there are lots of examples from the UK, from the US, from other parts of Europe, from Asia and elsewhere about, uh, about wearing masks. It's very important to remember that, um, that wearing a mask does not mean that you don't have to continue to adhere to the other measures which protect us all. Uh, the physical distancing still remains absolutely imperative uh, even when you're wearing a mask. Uh, the hand hygiene, the cough and sneeze etiquette. It's also very important that people uh, when they wear a mask, are uh, doing so safely and well. So before you put on your mask, you wash or sanitise your hand, uh, you put your mask on and then you don't touch your mask. You avoid touching it as much as possible because each time you touch it, uh, if you do have a virus on the uh, outside of the mask, then you're at risk of actually transmitting that to yourself. Uh, you wear the mask uh, appropriately, which means you don't wear it below your nose or below your chin. Um, and uh, when the mask becomes damp that you replace the mask uh, with a fresh and clean one. If you are wearing uh, reusable cotton uh, masks, these of course need to be laundered uh, properly uh, between uh, use uh, and if you're wearing uh, single-use surgical masks then these can only be used uh, one time and then they need to be discarded of uh, discarded appropriately uh, so that you don't put other people at risk. When you do take off your mask, after you've taken off your mask, you then uh, wash and sanitise your hands again. So it's it's not complex, but it's something new uh, for many of us uh, wearing a mask and again new habits which people are going to get into in order to make sure that they are using masks uh, appropriately and safely and not putting themselves and other people at risk. Just some very simple things that everyone can do. Um, maintain physical distancing, wash your hands and wear a mask. It's three simple things that really do help a lot in this fight against COVID. But for people up in Queensland or South Australia or Northern Territory and WA where there are very few COVID cases, is it still recommended that you adhere to all of those things? Because it seems that a lot of people are relaxing in some of the other states. Well, certainly we're still recommending that people are absolutely uh, rigorous in adhering to their hand hygiene and to their physical distancing at all times when they can. The wearing of masks is currently not recommended uh, in areas where we're not seeing community transmission, but we do recognise that there may be situations where people, and especially people who are more uh, vulnerable to serious illness from COVID-19, may feel comfortable 
uh, wearing a mask. And uh, we've seen that with people on public transport, where public transport may be crowded and physical distancing may not be possible, that people say, look, I'm, I'm still more comfortable wearing a mask. But uh, again, wearing a mask doesn't uh, remove the need for uh, the other precautions. And I think for those who are living in areas where we're not seeing community transmission at this time, we have still seen um, uh, cases occurring in some of those uh, other states and territories around Australia with people uh, travelling in from other parts of the country or again uh, people coming in from uh, outside Australia, either uh, repatriation flights or people uh, on the aircraft or the ships which are uh, importing and exporting goods. So uh, we, are, we are all living in a world where uh, COVID-19 still exists. As you say right from the outset, we're living in a world where we currently don't have uh, an effective vaccine against COVID-19. So we all all need to remain vigilant and careful. Professor Michael Kidd, thank you for that excellent advice and for clarifying those issues. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. And don't forget, for regular video updates from the Australian Academy of Science, make sure to follow us on social media. I'm Michelle Tapper. See you soon.